Oh, so I'm here um, tonight. Thank you all for being here. Is uh, Wade Matt? Hey, um, I talk about knee health and um, some running biomechanics uh, along with that. And Natalie Miners here as well. You brought handouts. Oh wow. I tried. Yeah, you make me not look so good. Oh, come so, on. So uh, with that, all my goal will be to get this on video up online in the next couple of weeks, and so you can actually watch the whole video presentation of both of us and listen to it as well. Uh, so feel free just to sit back and not worry about taking many notes unless you want to. And um, for me, it's very interactive. Feel free to ask questions. Our goal is about an hour and 15 minutes, myself going about 45 or so, and then Natalie going about a half an hour. Um, so a little bit about myself, uh, physical therapist for over 20 years now, working with a lot of triathletes, runners, cyclists, healthy and not so healthy individuals, meaning chronic neural pain to uh, Olympians and world champions. Uh, mostly just enjoy helping people accomplish their goals, whatever that means for them, uh, whether it be get out of knee pain or to, to win another gold medal. So enough for all that. Let's assume this is going to work. So let's talk about health and pain first, because before we set a, a foundation for how do you run faster, how do you get fitter, foundation of health really has to be there. For performance to happen, health has to be underneath that performance. So I think I'm going to go this side so that I can see my notes. Okay. So have you ever had a, a friend who had one of these diagnoses? Maybe they had some trauma, sprains, strains, aches. You know, maybe it was patellofemoral, maybe they had a surgery on their knee, and um, they had some cartilage problems. You know, maybe it was a, a tear in the meniscus. Let's see if I can, yeah. Maybe they had a meniscus tear, maybe it was an intercruciate tear. Maybe they had some cartilage problems such that they didn't have a lot of space in their joints, some osteoarthritis. Um, or maybe their patella, instead of setting at the center of the knee, maybe the knee was off to the side and they had a lot of compression over here. But interestingly enough, they still felt good. They had all these nasty diagnoses and all these problems on x-ray and MRI, but they didn't have much complaints of pain. So why can that be? And at the same time, people who have great joint lines and have great patella sitting on femur, and even have a kneecap that's in center, have severe pain. So it's really that dichotomy of, hey, I've got all these torn this, that, and the other, but yet you're running without pain and you're jumping without pain, but then you do an x-ray or an MRI for someone that you know, has a nasty herniated disc and they've got no pain at all. So why can you have nasty diagnoses and no pain and have beautiful MRIs and have lots of pain? So that's the first question I'd like to address. So diagnoses do not need to dictate health and function. And there's a really big difference between biological age, the number that you happen to be stuck with, and hopefully you get one more year in there, versus chronological age. So chronological age is, hey, I'm 40 something, right? But biological age is, you know, my number says 40, but I feel like I'm 70. Or my number says 70, and this guy at the age of 96 ran the New York City Marathon and was running a 10K all the way up until he was 102. You know, there was a gal, Joy, and I just lost her last name, from San Jose, who just completed New York City, and she was 92. So it's amazing that people run into the whatever age because their biological age, you know, is very different than their physiological age. A number doesn't mean how you are. So at any age, you can become pain-free and return to full function, and that's really what we're all about, is how do you get back to accomplishing your goals, no matter what that number reads. So why do some joints hurt and others don't? The first question we're going to try to answer. If we're going to understand what's keeping our bodies from functioning better, we first need to understand that the body is all one. It's interconnected and it's whole. And we're going to go deep into that. And the second thing we need to explore is the wellness account of our body. You know, how much health do we have inside of our system that really dictates our physiological age? So let's start by looking at our system as a whole and explore the interconnectedness of the system as well as some of the pieces and parts. This is Body World, and if you've ever gotten a chance to see it, it's just a beautiful uh, display. Um, Gunther, and I can never remember his last name, you know, dissects these things so that you can really see how the system of muscles really work together. So let's go deeper into that. First, the parts, you know, your knee joint, the femur, the patella, the tib, fib, and then the, uh, the 
bones above it and below it. And inside that knee joint, you have the patellar tendon and some pieces of cartilage. But most people think about this as cartilage, and it's true that that is the meniscus on the inside or the outside. But forget that we have this articular cartilage. The amount of um, smoothness or slipperiness between these two surfaces is slipperier than ice on ice. And when this very watery, very slippery substance of cartilage starts to diminish, it's when you start to see those bones come closer together. And bones aren't very slippery. You start to hear grinding and crackling and crunching when they start to get closer to one another and that cartilage starts to dissipate. So the tour of the lower extremity muscles, of course your quadriceps, your hamstrings, your calves. But what I really want to talk about is not just these muscles individually, but the muscles as a system. Because tensegrity is the idea that there's a connected system here, all suspended from one another. Each one of these struts, much like your knee joint, isn't connected to one another, touching one another, but all the struts of the muscles connect them throughout a system. So let's explore that for a second. So a muscle, let's say the hamstrings for instance, don't just start at your ischial tuberosity here and attach down to the back of the knee, but the fascia, that weaving that goes around the muscle and through the muscle, that web, which is much like if you can imagine dissecting an orange, that white stuff that goes around each one of the, each one of the orange slices and through that slice, that web of fascia runs not just from here to here, but into the next muscle and up into the next muscle. So that these systems, when you dissect them closely, you find one long string of muscles running up the back. This is called the superficial back line, is defined by Thomas Myers, or some of the lines that literally cross the body. So the number of times I see people who have, quote, tight hamstrings, and I look at that entire chain and I say, wow, it actually looks like your calf is tight. And we loosen up the calf and all of a sudden the hamstring mobility improves because that whole back chain is tight. So we have to start to think about these systems of muscles and how the foot is truly connected to the neck and how the shoulder is truly connected to the left hip. You know, the hip bone's connected to the knee bone, so to speak. So I like the, the visual of this like a wheel. And for those people who cycle, you know that each one of these spokes are individual. They're never touching the other spoke. But without each one of these spokes in balance, instead of having a wheel that's there we go. In a round where that wheel is equal side to side and equal around that circle, you start to end up with wheels that are very asymmetrical and side to side, and they're not very round. So each one of these spokes is interdependent on the other. So if the hamstrings are tight and the core is weak, then it starts to make that wheel out of round. It's much like the muscles on the left side or the right side of the body, or the muscles on the front versus the back. Those people that are kind of like this, and they go, I don't know why my back hurts. And it might be this that's causing this pain. Because we've got to think about these systems throughout the entire body. So these systems can either be at the knee, or they can be out throughout the entire body. So what happens when things are out of balance? That. So we land on our foot as we're running, and if our body is in nice balance, it hits the ground and it absorbs that shock, it stores that shock, and then it propels us into our next step. So when the wheel hits the ground, our body hits the, oops, wrong button. When our body hits the ground, it absorbs that shock nicely, as opposed to when it hits the ground and the knee starts to collapse, then the whole system starts to twist. And it might be the foot that's causing that twist, or it might be that old clavicle fracture that you had that's causing the twist. But a system that's in balance absorbs shock a lot better than that wheel absorbs shock. Because if the system has a lot of tension in one spoke and looseness in the other, weakness in the core or weakness in the glutes, then something happens to the system that's not near as efficient. So that's the system approach, and it's one that is very often overlooked for most physiotherapists or most chiros, or especially most physicians is the truth. You know, most physicians go, you've got a knee problem. It must be coming from your knee. I've got a, I've got a big hammer here, it's called a scalpel. Let me do a surgery on your knee. And they forget that knee pain just might be something coming from somewhere else. So next, let's ex understand why and why pain now. Oh, just one more comment about this. I like to think about, let's say this is someone's knees are hurting, but maybe it's a weak hip up here that's actually causing that knee to collapse. There is your criminal and there is your victim. 
So just because a victim might cry out, if I grab somebody's hair and I yank on their head, it's not the head I need to treat. I need to take care of this criminal over here because the criminal is what's causing the problem. I'm not gonna massage someone's scalp if someone else is yanking. I'm not gonna massage this person's knee if it's a weak glute that's causing the problem. Too often we're focused on just the victims, just what's hurting as opposed to the really finding what's causing the problems. So, step two, understanding why pain now. First step, understanding the interconnectedness. Number two, understanding a wellness account. What in the world do I mean by a wellness account? It's like a, a resilience account in our system. It's that person, again, who's 60 years old, and you'd swear by watching them move or listening to them talk, and they're talking about something when they were 16 years old. They're 60, but they remember things at 16. They're 60, but they move like they're 30. It's a resilience or health account. It's like any account in the body where you can put money into your bank account, and you can also take money out of that bank account. And how do we start to put money into that account? Let's start to talk about that. What are some of the withdrawals and what are some of the deposits? Well, the first one I see a lot of, well, let's see if it'll play automatically, there we go, is trauma. Because trauma not only happens where we hit the ground at, but trauma happens throughout the entire system, whether you're falling from a run, whether you're falling from a skateboard, because not only is his wrist going to hurt, but his neck is going to hurt. Not only is his ankles going to hurt, but that system had to absorb the shock. So the trauma is one of the biggest withdrawals I see for people that take money out of their account. And I don't care whether that's a trauma that happened last week or a trauma that happened 30 years ago when you fell on your tailbone. These traumas frequently continue to live inside of our system and they frequently allow joints. This is just an ankle joint down the back of the leg. It's nicely aligned. They frequently allow joints to be, instead of straight up and down, they allow those joints to be crooked. Whether we're talking about a kneecap that's out to the side, or a femur that's forward, or a pelvis that's rotated. You know, when we take falls, our body ends up with, I like to say, rocks in your shoe. If you had a rock in your shoe after about five or 10 minutes, and certainly after a couple of days, you would learn how to walk with that rock in your shoe, so it didn't hurt your foot anymore. But you would be compensating for that rock. Your hip would compensate, maybe your back would compensate, and you would continue to walk with that little bit of a limb that because of that old trauma, because of that rock, to eventually something else starts to hurt. The rock no longer hurts. Your body's figured out how to compensate for that trauma, but all of a sudden you're starting to have some other victim that's hurting because the criminal is still sitting there. So many times joints end up out of line, like this ankle, hips end up out of whack, low backs end up out of whack. It's just a very common thing. The trauma takes a big withdrawal out of our bank account. And it's one of those. It's one of the first things that starts to do that. I'm gonna scroll through here, see if I get past. There we go. Marvelous. Number two, the way we move, or more importantly, the way we don't move in life. Because this is what a lot of us look like. Honestly, a lot of us sit at the computer, or we bend over the bike, or we run in a hunched way, or we don't move with good posture or good efficiency, or we just don't move at all. And one of my favorite sayings is, the body is cement waiting to harden. So your mom was right, don't stick your tongue out because it's gonna stay that way. The body is cement waiting to harden. And if you spend enough time like this, sooner or later you're gonna stand up and go, I am straight. And go, no, you're not. Well, this is as far back as I can get. Your head gets forward, your shoulders get forward. All of a sudden you get stuck in that place just like you've had that rock in your shoe for a long time. This happens to be um, the calf of a runner I actually treated today. And I don't know whether you can see the dent right there. This is called myofascial decompression, also known as cupping. And when you grab the skin or grab the fascia underneath and you pull it away, it should be like pulling your shirt away from your skin. But if you can see right here, this little dent, I'll see if I can't get this to play. There we go. I've watched that little dent change. You'll see it diminish and increase. She had a stuck spot right here. Some years ago, she fell on her cat. It was about 12 or 13 years ago. In her shirt, in this case her cat, was glued down to her skin. And every time she would go to run, she would have pain in the ball of her foot because her calf was pulling the ball of her foot into the ground. Big picture, these things get stuck. Traumas cause tightnesses. 
The way we sit, the move, not move, cause tightnesses. And getting rid of some of these tightness so we don't end up stuck however we're stuck is a good thing. We want to get our resilience and our mobility back to something that looked like we were 25 or even 15. And believe it or not, at any age, you can drop lots of years off of your health account. Next. So if the first one is immobility or the way we're stuck in trauma, oh, there it is. The second one is surgery. Are you going to go for me? Yeah, there we go. So when I look at the fascia, this is the way it's supposed to move. This is from um, Gil Headley, it's the fuzz video, which is fun to watch. And you see all these little fibers in here. Imagine again, opening up that orange and seeing all those fibers nicely pull away from the skin. But what happens frequently with surgery, and it's a little hard to see here, um, instead of this, you get this. Or instead of this nice webby that really nicely moves skin, fascia, muscles on muscles, you start to get this. This is three weeks in a cast. You start to get all these fibers gluing to one another. So you go to straighten out your elbow and all of a sudden your elbow doesn't straighten enough, so your shoulder has to. All of a sudden your calf doesn't move enough, so your knee or your back has to. So surgeries leave scars too. Just like traumas leave scars, surgeries leave scars. Maybe it's that old appendix surgery, maybe it's that rotator cuff, maybe it's just the two little incisions you had to fix your meniscus. Those surgeries, those scars become the rocks which change how we move. So continuing on the health, what we start to find is over time, this happens. We start out with a lot of resilience and health, then we have that first trauma, and then maybe we do some therapy after trauma and we get a little healthier, but man, then I sit at work all day, and oh yeah, I don't eat very well, and we do okay for a couple years, and then all of a sudden we go out for that long, hard run. We double our miles, we run uphill, and now all of a sudden, instead of being in the green, not a lot in the green, now all of a sudden we're in the red. And when we're in the red, we bounce a check. And as soon as we bounce a check, the bank calls up and your knee says, now I'm hurting. I was fine when you had $5 in the account, but you just wrote a $10 check, and that $10 check means you're gonna hurt here. This becomes the victim of something else that's happened. This becomes a victim of all the times you've run with poor posture or poor posture. You've just wrote one too many check, and you don't understand why when you bent over that for that pencil one more time and your back went out. Because you've bent over and taken that $10 withdrawal thousands of times. Thousands of times sit in that wrong posture. Thousands of times eating that sugary food. It just starts to take money out of your account so that you end up being in the red. So enough parking on health. You're bouncing checks if you're not conscious about how you're putting in or taking out. So give me some ideas of how you start to put money in the health account. Talk to me about that. What do you think? There's a lot of them. Can't be wrong. Sleep. Sleep. You know, I too often don't hear that word, especially in this valley, sleep. And if there's one thing that puts the most money in that account, if you ask me how you can better heal from anything, sleep. How many hours? Bottom end for most people is seven. Some people need up to eight or eight and a half, and that's without training a lot. She's done a lot better. <laughs> One of my coaching clients, sorry. She's done awesome. Sorry. Um, so sleep, it makes a huge difference in your health and in your performance. The number of people I've seen that improve their performance by not two or three percent, but five, 10, 20 percent, just by getting another hour or half an hour of sleep. What else? I'm going to say hydration and nutrition. Because processed foods, you know, if your grandma didn't know how to pronounce that phospholipidase something on the back of the, 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 the package, if you can't read it, if you can't understand it, it's probably not worth eating. And I love, um, oh, I just lost his name up in Berkeley. Uh, food rules, anybody? Yeah, Colin. He's got a Twinkie that's been setting on his desk, I think it's now 12 years, or maybe it's 15 years. And he loves to say, if the bugs aren't willing to eat it, maybe I shouldn't either. <laughs> so there's, yeah, there's a lot of crap we eat. And food and nutrition, you know, it should just be healthy. And if it's not, it makes a huge difference in how well we heal and what happens to our bank account over time. So sleep, nutrition, what else? Exercise. Yeah, quality exercise. Quality, something that puts 
flexibility and mobility, strength back into our account. The number of endurance athletes I see that just lose strength because they're not actually getting into the gym or endurance athletes I work with that lose mobility because they're always in one position and they're never working into the others. Uh, exercise and movement, anything else? Recovery. Recovery, yeah, and specifically what? Taking time off when your body is Absolutely. So too many people just train and train and train and train some more. They're running away from something. Uh, so recovery and taking time off. So we need to train, but if you don't balance that training with some recovery, then you're really likely to get over overuse injuries. Stress, stress fractures in the feet are common, stress fractures in the back. So recovery and um, the balance of recovery, sleep, time off with exercise and movement. The body really likes both of those things. Anything else to throw in there? There's a lot more we can jump on. Good equipment. I'm sorry? Good Absolutely. Good yeah. Yeah, because if you're running in poor shoes, the wrong things for you. If you're running in, you know, bibs that don't fit you really well and you sit on the bike wrong, or, you know, those shoes are just too tight on your feet for um, cycling or your bike fits wrong, all the equipment that interacts with our body, all of that equipment will drive us to move in ways just like we got the rock in our shoe. That's a great one to add. So don't get stuck in the zone of pain. Stay up here, and the good news is, if you get down here, you can add money and start to increase or improve your physiological age. You can start to add resilience to your account. So, how do we start to put money back in our account? How do we start to grow younger? So, most of the people walk in with a lot of pain, injury, and dysfunction. And they say, you know, how do I, give me a pill to make me feel better. And yes, pharmacist, my doctor prescribed two anti-inflammatories and a knee replacement. Well, each capsule of your prescription contains your medication, but a list of all of its side effects and something to help the side effects. My point is, you know, no matter what surgery you get, there's a side effect. No matter what pill you take, there's a side effect. So we need to start to think about how to heal ourselves more in a holistic way. And how do we start to put health back into our overdrawn bank account? How do you basically start to think about going through rehab, getting your knee or your back healthier at the same time you run? Specific diagnosis, figure out why you hurt, what's going on. Number two, start to untie the stiff stuff. What's locking you down? Where is that fascia tight? Where are those joints tight? We're gonna go through each of these. Number three, start to change the way you move because your body has learned how to move in a way because of that rock, because of that weakness, because of that stiffness. So start to reload the software in the brain and change muscle memory patterns so that you're moving in a healthy, efficient way again. And then number four, work on strength and endurance. So let's talk about knee pain in each one of these. So the first step is figure out where and why things are happening. And I like to think about this as an inspector approach. Not just say what hurts, but why is it hurting? Because most of the time, if we just continue to clean up the what's hurting, it's kind of like putting a bucket underneath that drip when we really need to stop the drip, stop the leak that's happening and figuring out the underlying diagnosis. Otherwise, we just keep cleaning up the mess on the floor, or we just keep, okay, I'm gonna get that knee healthier, loosen up the IT band, but maybe it's the, the weak loop. So, find the primary driver and prime the cause. And I've already talked about this. Maybe the knee is hurting, maybe the, you've got some patellar tendonitis, or maybe you've got some hamstring injury. And not just treating the victim, but really figure out where the criminal is, so that way the victim doesn't keep on hurting. And just because it hurts, it's finding the bully in the system, whether that bully be the hip or the foot or the low back, and I've already made reference to this, just because it hurts, figure out why and who's yanking on it. Just because it doesn't necessarily mean it's causing the problem just because it hurts. Okay, comprehensive running evaluation. So when we start to think about running specifically to figure out where the problem is, maybe your knee hurts, but maybe it's because of the why you run or the how you run. You know, do you have good form or good posture when you're running? Let's talk a little bit about video and running analysis. 
So because of various technological issues, you probably saw me up here in the beginning playing with stuff. I went through um, four cables and two projectors. I ended up without a video running piece here tonight. Um, but some of the things that you need to pay attention to when you start to um, watch people run, we do a slow motion analysis, we draw the angles on. When you land, if you're watching a video analysis of the knee and you watch someone land, too often when people land, their knee drops in. Now why it drops in, refer back to the previous slide. Maybe it's a weak glute, maybe their foot's not strong enough, maybe they got something in the upper body. But too often when someone lands, you'll see this dropping in of the knee and this excessive pronation of the foot. Too often when you see somebody land, not only will their knee drop in, but their pelvis will drop. Their hip will rock and or twist. So we need to make sure that as someone lands, they're staying relatively straight on, not going through a lot of rotation, not going through a lot of a, we call this pronation, whether it's pronation at the foot or the dropping of the knee, from a looking at them in a sagittal way, as you do a video analysis, you need to make sure that things stay relatively sagittal. From a, um, from a side view, whether we're talking about running or whether we're talking about standing here, too often people will either run here or they'll run here. Um, can I pick on someone? Can I pick on you, Catherine? Sure. Sure. It'll be a nice demo, I promise. <laughs> I'll make you look good. <laughs> uh, face me this way. Turn and face me. So if Catherine is standing here in a good posture, and if she is landing on the ground and I put weight through her, I can put a whole lot of weight through her before she gets just a little bit of a sway through your back. Is that okay for you? Mm -hmm. um, do you remember your old posture? Thank you. <laughs> is that true? Yeah, that's, that's where you used to live, right? Yeah. Uh, professional cyc ex-professional cyclist who used to live here. And so, yeah. <laughs> Not an exaggeration. So go back there for me for a second. You don't have to be exaggerated about So now when she lands on the ground and her body starts to accept weight, watch what happens. She bows in her back. She bows in her knee. Her mid-back rounds. And her body is just not going to be happy with this. Take one step forward for me. Just one step and pause there. Perfect. So looking at her alignment here, I'm just going to, so looking at her alignment here, she is not back and she is not rounded. So if her goal is to push herself forward, she's got a nice a way to push into the ground without here or here. So if I say, I say, Catherine, hold, don't let me move you. And I'm just going to grade this. Hold, 20, 40, 60. There's her core that kicks in, 80. Right about there is where she gives way. Um, relax there, let yourself go into a little bit of slumpy. There you go. Hold. Wait a minute. Hold. <laughs> Hold. Yeah. So shake that out, go back to where you want to be. There you go. Hold. Does that look different? Yeah. Does it feel different to you? Yeah, yeah. you to Thank you. <laughs> So the big picture is when we're running, if we get too far behind ourselves or if we get rounded, if this line of posture doesn't stay and we start to collapse, that collapse runs through our body one way or another. Our core, in order for it to engage, which is exactly what I just did with Catherine, her core engaged when she was here. Her core won't engage here very well and it won't engage here very well. So when she's in a nice alignment, her whole body is much better. Her tensegrity system is ready to absorb shock and ready to push herself forward, as opposed to if she's here or here, that system can't adequately push. And so strength changes, speed changes, pain changes, when we are in a good posture and standing and when we're in a good posture and running. So if I look at someone from the front, I want them to have sagittal mechanics straight on. When I look at someone from the side, I want them to have this slight forward lean and be able to maintain that alignment as they walk. Does that make sense? I haven't gotten any questions yet. Yeah, okay. Uh, the next thing is what happens when you land on the ground? 
So this is a fun little toy I like to play with. Um, it's a pressure mapping system, and I'm hoping I'm live with it. So as I step on these pressure maps, as long as I get them on the right foot, as I step on these pressure maps, what it gives me is a visual of where that pressure is at. And as you can see with the one behind it, you can then do an analysis of how the force is going through the foot. So you're gonna to get to see me slide these on. I meant to have them set up on somebody else. There we go. Pressure on the left foot. I put them on on the right side, that's a good thing. Test my balance. Pressure on the right foot. And these get all strapped up to someone. Did he? What's that? Nah, I'm okay. Sure. Yeah. There we go. Okay. You see that? And then as I. Uh, Get a nice visual of what's up to happen. So right now I'm doing a pretty nice heel strike, looking at a midfoot land versus a forefoot land. Whole lot of weight on my toe side, whole lot of weight on the outside toe, and looking at how that weight goes through the foot as I push off. Make sense? Okay. Out. So what does that look like after the fact? Pull this over. Oh, that's why. Cancel. Over. Down. Push that. There we go. Beautiful. So, what does that look like after the fact? So, this happens to be Natalie uh, just before we started walking. And, uh, so, here's her landing and pushing off her left foot. Guess which color is not so good? Ouch, yellow. And look how she pushes off her right foot. So her right foot, she comes over the second toe pretty nicely on her left foot. Look at how much she lands on that big toe and how much she scoops over to the inside. And guess where she hurts? Left big toe, right there. So when we look at, there we go. The stability of pressure through here, that's a nice line. Look at how she lands on this left foot and she's all over the place trying to avoid that spot. So for us, the big picture of this is that just looking at the video analysis, I'm just going to pull these off before I kill myself. Just looking at the video analysis doesn't tell us what's happening when the foot hits the ground. Whether we want a heel strike, whether we want a midfoot strike or a forefoot strike. And that really depends on the person and their mechanics and needs. But this gives us how long are they on the heel? Do they have any excessive pronation? Are they staying on the outside of their foot? So pressure analysis is a big part of our video analysis and, our, and uh, what we do to figure out what's going on with your knee, what do your running mechanics look like? And we'll take you through this process when we're done. So if number one is a specific diagnosis, figure out where the problem is, do a video analysis. Oh, uh, there we go. That's what I missed. Uh, look at, finally look at your strength, your stability, what's your flexibility like in your hip, what's the core strength like, you know, do you have good mobility in your foot. So video analysis, uh, pressure analysis, and then finally a really good and detailed uh, physiotherapy evaluation. So step number one, a specific diagnosis. Step number two, untie the stiff stuff. What is locked up, what's still bound down in your body, why isn't it moving well? And let's see, I still have a challenge here. Sorry. There we go. Beautiful. So what's stiff and what's stuck? Restore the mobility in the joints and the soft tissues. Because remember back to that previous slide. 
When things are moving well, the fascia looks like this. After just a couple of weeks, the fascia starts to look like that. Muscles get bound to one another, just like your shirt can get stuck to your skin, your IT band gets can stuck to your outside quad, or that little bone in the foot can get stuck down to the ground. Please. It's, uh, so I pick up this force massage right now, and then the suit's always says we're kind of breaking up adhesions. Yes. Is that what we're kind of looking at? Today? Yes. That is an adhesion. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I like to just think about it as Elmer's glue or super glue. Adhesions are things that are stuck together. Yeah, well said. Thank you for the question. First one. Oops. Model out of the way. Number two. So that might be um, release what's stuck or not moving, whether it be fascia, tight or stiff muscles or joints, to allow for efficient alignment. Uh, because if you imagine putting a piece of duct tape across my body and I've got something stuck, my head doesn't want to pull over there, I do that. Ah, my head's in center now. But everything else has had to screw up in order to get there. So restoring efficient alignment so that our body doesn't have to start to cause other problems to get there. So restore efficient alignment. So what about mobility losses? How do we start to do that? In the clinic, we do a lot of joint mobilizations, you know, tug on a hip or tug on a foot, manipulate a spine or a pelvis. Uh, in the clinic, we do a lot of soft tissue stuff, meaning let me get my finger on that IT band and loosen up that knot. Let me get out some really cool tools, some grasping. <laughs> Catherine says, oh my god. Uh, just nasty tissue, just untying things. But more importantly, at home, that's really where it counts. You come in to see us and we give you a fair number of exercises to start to untie the stiff stuff. Whether it's using the foam roller of death, or whether it's using a ball in your glutes, or there's many other tools that you can do to start to unlock these nasty spots in the body, whether it be soft tissue or whether they be joint. So, if number one is figure out what's going on, number two is untie the stiff stuff, number three is to start to reload the software. Start to figure out how do we move again in an efficient way because for so long we've created a muscle memory pattern that isn't efficient. So let's talk about that. We call it in the world muscle memory or neuromuscular control in the physiotherapy world. So in your brain there's these places called the homunculus. There's one that has a sensation of your whole body and there's one that controls your whole body. So there's a part of your brain that says move this finger or move your big toe. Kill Bill reference, anybody? Uh, so there's a part of your brain that controls your finger, your mouth, your nose, your ears, etc. They're called your motor homunculus and your sensory homunculus. And what happens is we start to learn how to move in such a way that we avoid that tightness, that stiffness, that old pain point. Even though it doesn't hurt anymore, we've still got that muscle memory or that software program that's running there. So what do we really need to do is reload the software get new ways to work so that we're no longer moving in this posture because we thought we were supposed to be there. But to be able to start to move in this posture and push in this way, um, or sit like this instead of that. So we need to reteach our body how to move. And after we've untied the tight stuff, it doesn't mean you're gonna naturally go back to an efficient way of moving. It means your body's gonna go back to the way it's used to moving. Basically, I'm talking about good form. Learn how to move or sit or find good posture in a good way again. So re-educating optimal movement. I like to say, and this is one of my favorite quotes, our bodies, how did I write that? So our brains are programmable and we are the programmers. To really figure out how we, and I love this quote, we must activate the right muscles at the right time, in the right amount, in the correct sequence, and then turn them off in a timely way. It's, it's more challenging, and I've heard this, it's more challenging than landing a fighter jet, just picking up a cup of coffee. How do I relax that muscle? How do I tighten up that one? How do I make sure that one's working instead of that one? All these decisions our brain makes in an incredibly subconscious way. We don't have to think about it. Think back to the first time you learned how to tie your shoes or play the piano, or do the violin. Our brain had to learn all of those things, and that muscle memory is still stored. Many times that muscle memory needs to get rewound and reminded how to work in a different way, because we need to reprogram our brain so that it can get back to this place again, instead of something that's continuing to hurt us. Even though it might have happened at the foot, that old ankle sprain, and your ankle has learned how to move such that it hurts the knee. 
Okay, coming back to basic skills like walking and standing and good running form. This was a client I worked with. You gonna go there? Yeah, there we go. So he needed some footwork. These are deep, these are big terms for foot and calf work. Because when he would stand, are you gonna run for me? Nope. See if I can get it to go. When he would stand, he wouldn't stand like he is now with a decent arch on both sides. Watch him relax, that's where he would stand. Let's see if I can pause it, right there. So when he would relax, he would go into that. And he had the ability to stand and to go away, but his brain had forgotten how to use his foot muscles, his deep foot muscles, in order to stand in an efficient way. So when he would, and this was a professional cyclist, when he would push down on that pedal, his foot would collapse, his knee would collapse, his pelvis would collapse, and he would have pain in that knee. He's like, why is my left knee hurting? Every time someone looks through the left side of my body, it doesn't hurt. But they would push down on that pedal and whoop, there he would go, and that knee would hurt. And as soon as um, he learned how to wake up his foot, he could turn on and off his left knee pain. His right foot would get stable and his left knee pain would go away. He'd relax his right foot and there went his left knee. So waking up the muscles that have turned off are critical for your entire system. It gets support in the core of your foot. It gets support in the core of your abdominals or your shoulders. It makes sure all of these muscles that appropriately control and balance us, that hold us in good form when we land, don't collapse on us. Because gravity is a wicked mistress. And unless we figure out how to start to, or forget, for, unless we figure out, unless we can remind our body how to efficiently use gravity and accept our weight, we start to collapse and it starts to win. And this guy, his foot collapsed and his knee was losing. So for home, oops, come back one. For home, most importantly, it gave some exercises, including reminding him how to wake up his foot, strengthen his deep foot muscles, strengthen his calf muscles, and of course, when his foot does shut down, his butt shut down. And I can say that pretty much about most runners as I can cyclists. When the foot hits the ground, <laughs> there was this class that uh, was called, when the foot hits the ground, um, everything changes. And my friends would call it, when the foot hits the ground, the shit hits the fan. Because when the foot hits the ground, if it doesn't adequately stabilize you, then your glutes don't work well, your core doesn't work well. So what I'm trying to get at in the big picture here is we work as a system. And unless our bodies are like Christmas trees where the lights all light up, one light goes down and the rest of the system starts to not work very well. For him, it was your, his foot. For you, it might be your lower abdominals that's causing an issue when you run. So we need to reteach good mechanics with sport. Uh, with appropriate biofeedback, maybe that's a video analysis, maybe that's getting you running in front of a mirror or, or a mirror beside you, maybe that's to teach you how it feels to inappropriately hit with your heel and the hardness of that landing versus appropriately land on your midfoot and feel the softness of that landing or being able to hear that or being able to feel, oh wow, I feel my body absorb that shock versus, oh, I feel my back land and hit. So some sort of a feedback so you know, am I doing this right? Because if we're trying to retrain movement patterns and you don't know whether you're doing it right, you just don't have any way of changing. You need to know whether you're getting 100% or a 30% and some feedback loops to be able to do that. We do a lot of video analysis here. We do a lot of using biofeedback with the GBMIs. And most importantly, you need to be able to feel it in your own body. So frequently we'll use mirrors and tape, um, kinesio tape, rock tape, because when you feel the, too many people have gone from one extreme of running to the other extreme of running, and this running posture does just as much challenge for your back and your knee as this running posture. So being able to put tape on the body so that the tape, the tape gives you a feedback of, oh, I feel this tape stretch or I feel this tape tug when my knee drops in. Some sort of a feedback loop, whether it be tape or a visual that allows you to know. So, video analysis already talked about quite a bit. Next, final piece, final review. Figure out what's going wrong. Untie the stiff stuff. Retrain the brain. Final piece is strength and endurance. So I don't care how loose you are, I don't care how much you know how to move, when it comes right down to it, if you're running on a flat hand, good. As soon as I start to run up the hill and I have to push harder, if you don't have the strength to be able to push in the right way, you start to lose your mechanics. 
or hey, I feel great the first three miles. I've got good enough endurance of my core to be able to land for three miles. I've got good enough endurance of my foot to be able to accept the great ground forces. But three miles into it, I start to lose my foot endurance. And now all of the things, sudden things start to change and drop. So my favorite visuals here, you need strength and you need endurance. This, um, I've worked with a fair number of people that have done 100 mile runs. And you know, 100 miles into a run, if you don't have good endurance, something's gonna hurt. And the truth is 20 or five or even two miles into a run, if you only have enough endurance for two miles and you start to run out of that, you get in trouble. So many people went to um, some of the barefoot running or some of the minimalist running, which I really like and support in so many ways. Certainly not for everybody. With that being said, they go, you know, I am comfortable in these very stable, very stiff, very supportive shoes today. And I can go out and run, you know, a 10K today. And tomorrow I'm gonna take this cast of a shoe and I'm gonna throw it out and I'm gonna jump in a shoe that gives me no support. And then they wonder why they hurt whether it's their knee or their calf, because they don't have enough strength and endurance to be able to make that huge change from basically a cast or like lumbar support or a cast around the foot and their body goes, you want me to support you? I don't have enough strength or endurance for this. So um, minimalist shoes can be really nice as a training tool. Many times they're abused instead of used appropriately like so many training tools are. But you need endurance. Uh, you need endurance to be able to keep good form over the period at which you're running, whatever that running is, 5, 10, 50, or 100 miles. Okay, so how do we get strength endurance? We make sure that we do um, system-specific training, especially around your weakness, whether that's, you know, your weakness is in your glute, your core, your foot. Make sure we identify that specific weak spot and train it specifically because the body is amazing at compensating. It will figure out how to get around your weak core. It'll figure out how to get around your weak foot, whatever that is. So whether that's core strength or glute hip strength or the local knee muscles, especially the inside quad, whatever that strength needs to be, just figure it out. I'm gonna jump through this, but why in the world core for your ankle and your knee health? I like to say if you're shooting a cannon, if you're shooting one of these big muscles on top of a canoe, that cannon on a canoe doesn't work very well. You know, you need to be able to have lots of strength and stability here to be able to fire your glutes or hamstrings. Otherwise, the canoe's rocking and everyone's hurting. Uh, I'm gonna jump through him uh, just to say that the knee frequently drops and just wait, you can see the knee drop there. Just waking up his foot and his core and he'll do it here. As soon as he was able to reload the software, remind his body how to connect with his foot and his core, which is what he just did in his mind, all of a sudden his knee goes, hey, I'm straight. I'm not really good at it yet, but now I can push down on the ground without falling. Really common issues. So make sure that you retrain stuff. And in this case, it's backward lunging, leg presses, BMO, whatever that is. So why with the same diagnosis do some knees hurt, some ankles hurt? Why with the same diagnosis do some people don't hurt? So for me, it's all about putting more health into their bank account, putting more into the bank account than they're taking out. So in summary, don't just think about diagnosis. Think about how healthy can your knee be? How healthy can your body be? And how do you start to move yourself forward in that? Because too often, all we've got is a hammer and we just keep doing the same thing again and again, hitting that nail and we assume it's a nail and we need something else. Or, my favorite one, doing the same thing and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. <laughs> and if you always do what you've always done, then you always get what you've always got. So change is most of the time what we need. Figuring out how to do things in a smarter way. Figure out what's going on. Reload our software. Get things changed in our bodies so we don't hurt anymore. So be healthy and strong, and thanks for having me. So for those of you who know me, know me, uh, about a year ago now, I um, herniated two cervical discs. I've got a, a nine millimeter protrusion and a six millimeter protrusion that caused me nasty pain in my arm. I mean, just like, and so in combination with physical therapy, I was able to get back to riding my bike and crashing again um, without pain uh, because of some awesome PTs here and because of Natalie. 
So I found that combination of the, you know, the physical therapy plus the acupuncture um, or plus whatever that other adjunct modality is. But Natalie's gotten me out of a lot of pain in the last, you know, took me, you know, two months or so to be able to get back on the bike. Uh, and I just continue to find with uh, all my patients or with many of my patients that hurt, sometimes it, it really makes a big difference. So I've invited her here to help us out. Thanks. Give me that. It's the arrow. Yeah. Lights. Or the lights. Oh, so it's that guy. Joe Fuller. The green. Oh, the, um, I don't know about that. It's the, this guy right here. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. It's my pleasure to talk to you today. I will basically go to the same points, but with a little bit Chinese flavor. First, oh, yeah. let, let me introduce myself. Uh, uh, I began as research in mechanical engineering. I have master degree in mechanical engineering and spent 20 years in the, the numerical solution of the differential equations. But <laughs> it was in my past Russian life. Uh, then I went to psychology, and when I moved to America, I was graduated from university with a master's degree in Chinese medicine. Why? There is my story. Many years ago, I was in the car with my son sleeping on my hands when the car crashed to the tree, and uh, my leg was broken. My leg was broken and didn't heal well, after two months of Western approach, they said that I should consider amputation. Uh, I said that I would consider something different. At that point, I was a yoga instructor. I was always in the sports. So I couldn't imagine myself without blood. So I began yoga breathing. I found a acupuncturist. And in two weeks, I was able to walk and run again. So I was very impressed. I learned the technique uh, which helped me. It was Korean style of the function on the hand. And when I moved in America, it was a good place to start a new career. I went through the full training for years. And now I'm seven years in practice and very happy about it. So talking about knees, my interest in knees increased after I signed up for the half marathon. I was always swimmer and it's running very different dynamic. So I'm learning how to walk and run again. And talking about knees, if you have problems and went to the doctor, you will be one of the 20 millions who did this during the last year. And many people will come to the doctor and end up with a surgery. It's another million was in the 2006, now it's more, because with each year the number of surgeries is increasing. And 7,000 of them, uh, 700,000 will end up with a full knee replacement. It can be avoided. So, we have wonderful diagnostic tool in Western medicine. Unfortunately, they do not know what to do with the functional uh, problem. They do know how to cut, how to sew, but they have no idea what to do with the overstretch or imbalanced muscle when it's not on the destruction yet. So there is other solution. There is acupuncture. So, on the table you will find the handouts with a list of researchers showing that acupuncture does work. It's not foo-foo or voodoo thing. It has physical evidence. There are MRIs showing the density of capillaries in the acupuncture points different from the areas around. There is uh, MRIs on the brain in the real time showing that when the needle 
go into the acupuncture point, the certain areas of the brain are lightening up. So, uh, you can grab the list or you can give me your email, I will be happy to send it to you electronic copy. So, how it works and why it works. As I said, when we put the needle in one point, the point in the brain lightening up, and this particular point will be connected to the other area of the body as well. So this way we have this connection through the brain to the other areas. Uh, another important thing to know about acupuncture that it works mostly with the fascia. Fascia is ta 10 times wiser, smarter than the muscles. This wrapping thing around each and every organ, each and every muscle, each and every cell is very, very smart. So when we were inside our mom's, very young, like three weeks old, we were looking approximately like this. There was the beginning of the mm, digestive tract where the mouth, and there is the end of the digestive tract where the anus is. And the connection between these two points was kind of clear and easy to see from point A to point B, straight forward. When we're growing up, the structure changed, became very strange shape, but these lane, lines between point A and point B, they're still there. Body has memory of it. And if you know how and where it's connected, you can talk to them. So when I put needle here in point A, A, I'm talking to point B. Okay. Does it work or not? The easiest way to say that it does work, make experiment on the animals. Animals cannot lie. They will feel better or they will not. How we will know that they feel, feel better? Well, I work with the dog of my friend and first time I came, she didn't react to me. She was too sick. She was just laying on her mat. I put the needle on, on her and she became better, her tail became twinkle. Next time I came to their house, she was crawling toward me because she wanted this needle. So it was proof for me that it works. <laughs> so now talking about the leg. On the leg, we have six channels. And Carter began to speak about the holistic way, thinking about the human body, which is kind of new and very progressive thinking in the Western culture. In the Eastern, in the Chinese, it's old enough. It's more than 5,000 years old. We are looking at the human body as a one and whole. We including in the system not only muscles and organs, we including in the system emotions and mental uh, abilities. So, talking about the knee, uh, about the leg channels, they are going from the leg to the head, to the torso. It's not just local thing. So, on the leg we have six channels, channels three of them in, three of them young. In is a, a all Chinese medicine about balancing yin and yang. Yin is a dark, slow, heavy, what else? Old. Yang is something bright, sparkly, moving, easy. So we have to have this balance. If we have too much yang, we have ADD. <laughs> if we have too much yin, we will have lethargy. So there is all about balance. 
And the same we can look for in the knee-tails, the balance between lateral and medial areas, between front and back, between muscles below the knee and above the knee. So talking about the channels, which channels are going through the knee? On the front, it is stomach channel and spleen channel. They both related to the earth element, which govern the digestive system. On the sides, we have gallbladder and liver. These channels related to the wood element, which is fighter. It's a stress response element. Emotion for this element is anger and decision making. It's a gallbladder job. So when we under the stress, we have to make decision. What we will do? Will we fight? Will we fight? Or so on. So liver and gallbladder stress related channel. And behind, it's a urinary bladder and kidney channels, which are related to the water channel. And uh, basically, hold us vertically because urinary bladder channels begin in the inner corner of the eye, go uh, through the head, through pull back, and um, end up in the little toe on your leg. So by holding this channel in tone, you hold yourself erect. Now let's talk about case studies from my practice. The volleyball player came to me because she couldn't serve anymore. She was preparing for the competition and during the training felt uh, had a trauma on, on her leg. Trauma healed and she was fine, but her servants disappeared. She couldn't serve. There was no any problems with the shoulder. So when she came to me, I worked with her gallbladder channel, which was exactly on the area of her of her bruise from trauma. And this channel goes through the shoulder as well. So this was one option. The other guy, this was my favorite. A former football player was in the construction for a long time and was promoted to the manager. Guy very strong, had a history of trauma on his knees, but it didn't bother him so much. But as soon as he became manager, his sinus became clogged, his knee began, began to bother him, his digestion system was going through the toilet, literally, because it was constipation or diarrhea. <laughs> so it was a disaster, especially difficult time was when he was under the stress, meeting deadlines. It was a nightmare. So we began to analyze when and how it happens, and his main pain was located around the stomach channel. Sinus is where the stomach channel begins. It begins right here under the eye. And the digestive system is governed by the stomach and spleen channel. So basically we, the part of the treatment plan was mm, make his management tasks digestible for him. Put it in the small pieces, small projects. Because he knows how to do the job. It's just overwhelming amount of it was stressful for him. So when he put it in the small boxes, he was able to put these boxes in place easily. And his knee pain disappeared. Imagine that. So for him, treatment for the knee was stress reduction treatment. 
and heat meat and urinary bladder channel. Heat meat in Chinese medicine, the organ which contains the essence of your being. It's what you get from your parents. Basically, it's DNA in Western medicine. You get it in the beginning, and you have it for life, that amount. So with the age you spend in it, you can slow down the spending by being good in diet, being good in exercise, but the number of essence is length of your life, basically. And with the age, the kidney channel is kind of shrinking and shortening. So it goes from the bottom of the, of the foot through the inner part of the leg, through the front line. And imagine that if this is front line, how it's shrinking, we are becoming hunched, <laughs> depressed, and so on. Keeping yourself hydrated will nourish the kidney, will allow you to be flexible, elastic, and be able to breathe. So uh, with acupuncture, this is a, after one session, person came to me with a tight IT band, knee pain, and you can see how she was falling forward. It's her posture before session. After the treatment, she was much straighter and her pain was down to 0.5 versus seven when she came. So you do have uh, ability to massage the points around the knee, but again, before you go to the local points, you need to understand where the problem is. If it's the imbalance between the muscles just around the knee, or it's your postural problem and it's somewhere else. So talk to the specialist for assessment. Without assessment, you are guessing. So diagnosis is the first and most important part of the treatment. So what take home? Water. Water, water, water. I cannot stress this enough, especially for the runners. You are dehydrated so much so often with the dehydration, the tendons are very fragile and easily can be broken, teared. Uh, hydration is what allows muscles to be flexible, to use the full potential of the muscle. So if you want to run strong, be sure that your muscles are flexible. Healthy diet, healthy knee, stomach, spleen channels. It's your digestive system. They're going directly through the knee. Health of digestive knee system represent in your knee, literally, by the stomach and spleen channel. If you eat crappy, you will walk crappy. It's that simple. And Balance your activity and rest. We were talking about this. Sleep, rest is as important as training. Give yourself time to restore yourself. Okay, and today I will have time to show some techniques which I'm using, some acupressure techniques which I'm using in my clinic. Uh, we'll be happy to walk with the ear, reflexology if you need any help, and I guess that's it, we are out of time. Yeah. Um, anyone that has questions, we're hanging out for a little bit, uh, Natalie's doing some reassessment stuff, and I'm certainly willing to take a look at anything for a couple of minutes as well. I really appreciate your tenderness and everyone making it out tonight. Thank you so much again. Okay.